We'll now start the second session, and this is one of the, the highlights for me personally because BBR has uh, been uh, on a journey for about the last 12 years or so uh, and instigated a direct PhD program. We've had around about 10 students now, some who have uh, have finished uh, and are working within BBRO, which is a great testament to the program. Others have gone out to work elsewhere within the industry as well, which is also very positive. But what we would like to do now is just to sh showcase five of the students. Uh, three are here in person and we have two uh, recordings. Uh, and they've got two minutes each to sell their PhD to you and to give you the key point and the key finding and the key result that they have at the moment. So what I'll do now is invite Angara Compton from the University of Nottingham onto the stage to talk about her disease control work. Um, thanks, Mark. So as Mark said, I'm Angara Compton. So I'm from the University of Nottingham looking at integrated fungal folia disease management of sugar beet. So my main focus is rust and cercospora. So I'm particularly looking at fungicide usage and also resistant varieties. So the really interesting data that I've got this year that I want to highlight to you is my alternating row treatments. So this is stripes of resistant and susceptible varieties. And this is for both rust and cercospora showing to actually really reduce the amount of disease comparable to the susceptible grown on its own. So those are without any fungicide treatment. So this is really exciting and hopefully we'll get more info on it this year. So, Angara, have you got the, the yield data? Or are you still waiting on the BBR? Still waiting, so it was harvested last week, so just waiting for the yield data, which will hopefully back up what we're seeing just from the disease data. And what did canopies look like in January, which is key for late lifting? Um, they were, they were like almost halved on some of it for compared to earlier in the year. You could definitely tell that we had had winter. Um, but yeah, but it's looking good. And plans for 2024? Um, probably a repeat of this year to uh, this trial to back up this data to make sure that it's nice, solid, and we're getting the same findings. So many thanks indeed, Angard, and clearly important when it comes to variety choice and fungicide strategy. <laughs> the next presentation. Uh, which will be a recording, is from uh, Nyan Burra, who has just completed her PhD at the University of oh, Harper Adams, uh, who's been working on uh, stubby root nematodes, free living nematode control. And when I press this button, you will hear her present some of her findings uh, of her PhD. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this presentation. This project focused on evaluation of cover crops for management of stubby root nematodes. Stubby root nematodes feed on roots of sugar beet, causing docking disorder, where the tap root stops growing and the lateral roots thicken, causing a fungi root system, as is visible in this uh, picture, where the healthy roots have an intact tap root system, as compared to the roots with docking disorder. As a result, root yield have been reported to be reduced by over 50%, and also there is increased soil tear due to the fungi roots. In this study, we investigated cover crops from diverse plant families, i.e. brassicas, grasses, phacelia, and opium. One of the field trials was set up at Barris at Edmonds in Suffolk, where three brassica species, that is Indian mustard, daikon radish, and oilseed radish, were investigated. The results from the trend in the stubby root nematodes at different sampling points showed that at four weeks after planting, stubby root nematodes were significantly reduced in plots drilled with brassicas as compared to the fallow control. This was also the case after incorporation where plots with brassicas still had significantly lower densities compared to the fallow. However, we also observed a decline in the fallow where the nematodes were had decreased from the initial four weeks after planting, and this was as a result of the rotavation process which was done in all plots during the incorporation process. The reproduction factor as seen in the bar graph here also shows that the reproduction in Indian mustard and oilseed radish was significantly lower compared to the fallow, but this was not the case for the daikon radish where it was higher. The field experiments in at docking in Norfolk was with cover crops from diverse plant species, and results from final stability nematodes at sugar beet harvest showed that 
plots following Facilia, Opium Poppy, Allseed Radish, and Endophyte Grass had significantly reduced uh, stability nematode densities compared to cover crops such as Italian ryegrass and Neil Endophyte Grass. We also observed that the fallows disturbed and sterile fallows also had reduced uh, stubby root nematode densities compared to the fallow which was undisturbed and weeds were not managed. There was also a positive relationship observed between nematodes that we recorded during the cover crop growth and the nematodes that we recorded at sugar beet harvest, showing that nematodes at sugar beet drilling influence the final densities that are observed. The sugar beet quality parameters such as soil, layer, soil tear and root fanging percentage was also shown to be significantly lower in plots with lower densities as compared to plots with higher densities. In conclusion, facility and opium poppy are less preferred hosts. Brassicas can be potentially management of stubby root nematodes if optimized as observed in the Suffolk trial. Soil disturbance contributes to stubby root nematodes due to their sensitivity to mechanical handling and weeds play a critical role in nematode multiplication and hide stubby root nematodes before sugar beet drilling increase the fanging symptoms. I would like to acknowledge the founders of this project and the supervisors for their contribution. Thank you for listening. Clearly, we rely heavily uh, on the use of garlic uh, post the use of oxymil. Uh, and some of these findings ultimately may need to be taken on board as we go forward for free living nematode control, particularly with uh, warming wet spring scenarios where we need to think about all the options that are available. So the next uh, uh, PhD is at the University of Lincoln. It's AFIDNET, uh, Zhu Ming Gao is the PhD student. Now, no one likes counting aphids. If you've got a pathological desire to count aphids, there is something wrong with you, but we probably have, uh, and I could probably count myself as that, but uh, uh, we've been actually looking at new ways of trying to identify aphids to simplify that process. So if I invite Zoom in onto stage, he'll give you a quick outline and, and demonstrate with a yellow water pan how potentially we may be taking this forward. Over to you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Zoom in from University of Lincoln, second year PhD student. Uh, so basically my project is about the automatic aphids counting by using AI technology, also related to robotic uh, technology. So basically I'm so quickly so how to its work. So basically currently we take images from this yellow pan which you to attract the uh, aphids. Then we image will be uploaded to uploaded to the cloud server and uh, computing it and we will got the result by the algorithm so got the how much it is in the order of uh, so next step we probably focus on uh, a more focus uh, use the, some of the body technology uh, or candlelight things to yeah just yeah yeah that's the mic. Uh, yeah to candlelight to handle the more uh, tricky, uh, tricky problems about uh, if it's a country. All right, thank you very much. So, thank you, Zoom in. It's a fascinating project, uh, and uh, clearly we're potentially going to be seeing some interesting robots uh, in, in the field. What is the biggest challenge, do you think, about trying to identify an aphid from the images that you have so far? Um, I think it's a big problem is uh, very difficult from the. Uh, image take by the smartphone or any 2D image device to differentiate different aphids, different species. Yeah. yeah, it's very difficult. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, yep. Zoom in, and it's going to be a fascinating project thank to keep, uh, keep an eye on. Uh, and it sort of links through to the work that we have at the moment ongoing with Sasha White, because are there different ways we can produce thresholds. It'd be so much easier if we had that algorithm on your smartphone, take a photograph of a yellow water pan, it pings up the number of Mises persky, but you've got to remember there are 600 other aphid species out there and have that, take, that capability to simplify. And I'm sure the agronomists in the room would think that's fantastic. But something we're working towards and watch this space on that one. The next presentation 
uh, is our student Shoella Schrupp in the Netherlands. It's a project supported by BBRO alongside IRS and Cess van der Haave as well as Cozen Beat and Wageningen University. She will complete in uh, April this year and she's been looking at mature plant resistance. It's some work that BBRO was involved in over 20 years ago, but we hit a brick wall. But with the latest technologies, we've been able to make some really interesting progress. So I'll press the button and you'll hear what Shoella has to say with regard to what she's achieved so far. Hello everyone, my name is Shirella Schop, and in the last four years I've been working on mature plant resistance for my PhD project. Mature plant resistance is a resistance mechanism in sugar beet in which the crop becomes resistant to aphids when they have reached the 12 leaf stage. And aphids that are feeding on these older plants will form a black stomach deposit, as you can see behind me, and they will subsequently die within 36 hours. Also, aphids' reproduction rates are lower on these older plants. Aphids transmit many viruses in sugar beet, and they, these viruses can lead to high yield losses. And therefore, we would like to know what compound is the sugar beet producing that is leading to high aphid mortality. During my PhD project, we observed only small differences between genotype, as can be seen in the graph behind me. However, we did observe that environmental factors, such as nutrient availability of the soil or darkening of the leaves, strongly induces mature plant resistance, while virus infection strongly reduces mature plant resistance. Thus, environmental factors strongly affect resistance levels towards the aphid. We think mature plant resistance are Levels are depending on the physiological state of the plant and that the plant's physiology is directly affected by environmental factors. We also hypothesize that phenol conversion into very reactive quinones and subsequently melanin by the enzyme polyphenol oxidase is leading to black deposit formation of the aphid stomach and aphid mortality subsequently. And that the aphid, aphid takes up all these phenols and enzymes via the phloem on which they are feeding. Currently, we are performing metabolomics and transcriptomic studies to investigate well what transcripts and metabolites are produced in the plant leaves and that result in high resistance levels. Also, we are investigating what metabolites are taken up by the aphid and subsequently converted into uh, the black stomach. Hopefully, identification of the pathway involved in mature plant resistance could help breeders to obtain varieties with earlier onset of mature plant resistance of higher levels of mature plant resistance, and thereby we can reduce aphid levels already early in the field. Thank you for listening. I think what is particularly exciting is we now start to appreciate mature plant resistance at molecular level, and ultimately at a field level that may lead to sort of aphid strategies alongside virus tolerance and resistance. So if you've got a durable approach to both the virus and the aphid, then that gives hopefully longevity to any strategy that we want to deploy going forward. So watch this space. It won't happen tomorrow, but clearly we have made some advances that uh, uh, modern day technologies that we didn't have 20 years ago have been able to help us get to the stage we are now. The final presentation of this session is my new colleague, sort of, uh, Susanna Harder, who has uh, just completed and submitted her PhD uh, two weeks ago, and she will tell us about the strain variation work in relation to future genetics. Susanna, over to you. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Mark, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm going to do my best to uh, condense about uh, 280 pages of research into two minutes. So uh, here we go, everyone. Uh, as Mark says, uh, my PhD has been on virus yellows, looking a little bit uh, more into the detail of those species which cause the disease. So the real question was, are there strains within the species? To use a COVID analogy, is there an Omicron variant of beet mild out there? And uh, the varieties which uh, Alistair has been talking to you about this morning that are being developed to overcome them, could they deal with that uh, strain if it was present? So hopefully uh, some of you will remember the talks I've given in previous years at these events. Over the four years of my project, I've conducted uh, two uh, field trials. These field trials were really quite novel. I collected uh, virus isolates from across the UK, from both fodder beet, sugar beet and sea beet. And culturing them in the lab, we managed to establish uh, six different virus uh, cultures. So these uh, all went through uh, genetic analysis. I did the sequencing data for all of these. And we did identify 
different genetics between those isolates. So uh, from that, we then took those out into the field uh, and tested different resistant and susceptible varieties with them. They did perform differently, which combined with the genetic data means that we do perhaps have strains of those virus species. But fundamentally, uh, the most important thing and most important finding of my research is that although there are differences, the varieties which were resistant always outperformed the susceptible. And there was no reason to think that some of those strains would not be able to be combated by the varieties which are being developed. <coughs> Thank you, Susanna. One quick question. I know you've done some uh, quite detailed sequencing, which is fascinating. Again, modern day technology enables us to do much more these days, especially when I was trying to do it manually many years ago. But when it comes to the virus isolates that we have in the UK, what's the distribution that we have at the moment? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think uh, previously perhaps we thought uh, that beet mild uh, was generally the most prevalent. I think now uh, we think that beet chlorosis is. Um, the key difference is that uh, for some reason, on some years, we do have beet yellows virus epidemic years. And I think that's still a question. We don't fully understand why on those some years beet yellows does seem to really come in. But in a standard year, I think beet chlorosis is, is now perhaps the, the most common, which is good because that's the one with the lowest yield loss, I guess. And what is also really encouraging is uh, you've got durable resistance to polio viruses from what you've shown from your work. Exactly. So both beet mold and beet chlorosis, which is really, really encouraging, isn't it? Yes, yes. There's no reason to think that, uh, yes, these vaccinated sugar beet are going to be uh, overcome. So Susanna doesn't escape, as I say. She'll be clearly working on more of this as we go through future years within the BBRO. So thank you very much. Thank you. You beat me to it to ask for applause for the students, but hopefully that gives you a, a bit of a snapshot of, of some of the students that we have. Clearly it's a really important process, uh, and it's great to be able to find the new talent of the future, who hopefully will be standing up here in years to come to answer and address the issues with such an interesting crop. So thank you all very much.